What is your virtual machine? So you can tell me the difference between a virtual machine and Docker. Fundamental difference. Jerry. No. <laughs> so the fundamental difference between a virtual machine and Docker is that a virtual machine has its own operating system. When you boot up a virtual machine, you're booting up the entire operating system and from scratch it can take a couple of minutes. When you boot up a Docker container, it should take a couple of seconds because you're sharing the operating system. You're sharing the kernel. You can see there on the left that we have our VMs there, each with its own uh, operating system. And on the right, we have a Docker container. We're running FB and some libraries, but they're sharing a host <coughs> operating system. Great interview question. It's all applied for jobs at banks. <laughs> Production grade. Okay. If you take anything, no, don't take this. If you take anything for, uh, to, today out, it's the phrase production grade. A lot of people aren't aware of what Kubernetes does or the services it provides because they just create their app and then they just say, "Here, ops, it's your turn." And then the ops guys have to actually spend the the, the rest of the week using your name as a swear word. <laughs> Production grade container orchestration. What is its core features? Container orchestration, what does that mean? Remember those two billion containers that Google uh, managed? So it's managing those on a scheduled basis. It's horizontal scaling. And we'll go through exactly how to do that later. But if you uh, were following Obama, you know that when he tweeted, what happened? When he tweeted on his uh, election, he broke, he broke the internet because they didn't have the ability to scale out horizontally to handle that type of bandwidth. Rolling deployments, uh, deployments and rollbacks. Okay, so if, you're, if I get invited here again, we'll talk through Canary and uh, Blue Green deployments and how to actually trick your customer into think that they're actually on the latest and greatest when in essence you're actually giving them a beta version of their system. Self-healing. This is broken. Move it off. Keep it aside, move it onto a server that is actually working. And then service discovery and load balancing. Now why are these important? Because we're building microservices. Each one of those little boats there is holding a, a little docker container. And that's what we encounter at VPD when we actually engage with clients. When they say microservices, that's not microservices. I did a session recently um, at the other user group and they have, uh, the client that uh, we engage with, they have a Kubernetes cluster of 200 nodes. When you do want to create your microservice architecture, you can use one of these. We recently had a session at the Docker user group um, on Rancher, and you can use one of these. Amazon EKS, Minikube, Rancher, Google, uh, Google Kubernetes API. Anyone heard of Google Kubernetes API? I had to actually reverse image sort, uh, search that icon because I couldn't even find it. Um, and then also Ubuntu has now baked in Kubernetes. And then we also have Azure uh, container services here. Any Microsoft ladies here? <laughs> so you can use any of those to manage your Kubernetes, or you can use the wizard. So what is this wizard installing here? So this wizard is installing the latest version of Docker. <laughs> Anyone here running Edge? Docker Edge? Oh, it doesn't work on Linux. It doesn't work on Linux as such. So uh, Docker Edge comes baked in with Kubernetes. You get the <clears> standard <throat> Docker services and you get Kubernetes out of the box. This isn't an option anymore, people. This is actually baked into uh, Docker. To enable Kubernetes, all you have to do is just tick that little checkbox that I can't reach. And then <laughs> this thing that I can reach up, you just get Kubernetes is running. And then all my operates. <laughs> you're running there, once you get that, you're running an enterprise production grade cluster on your laptop. It's the same cluster that most of your salaries go through every month. So, how does this work? Now, we could actually hire a consultant, we could actually get you know, some fancy cloud guard to come and try to sell you stuff and everything like that. 
Or you could just read the Dilbert cartoon and then you can just chuckle. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so this is Rory engaging with the Kubernetes cluster. And then he uses a tool called kubectl. Kubectl is a nice wrapper. Remember Google uh, Org 3? Basically, introduce REST services. kubectl is a wrapper for your REST services. And I speak directly to the API server managing the Kubernetes slash Borg cluster management. The API server is part of the master control, and it also includes a nice scheduler when I ask you to do something. It will kind of schedule it. You'll see when we do the example there. It will kind of do it when it wants. And then also the controller manager to go and roll out those changes to the nodes. So nodes, pods, images. There's a nice way to actually remember that. A node is your physical tin. It's your server that you provision. It's a physical server. Your actual pods are your individual containers that you're running. Your Docker containers. Now, the difficult part in understanding is that your pod can actually run two containers. We'll go through that when we get through the advanced section of Kubernetes. Your node, your physical tin, and each one of those node servers has services in there to manage and to help you roll out to those nodes. It has a kubelet, a little service that runs there, and also a Docker service that runs there. Because we're going to tell it, hey, listen, go and uh, run the service on your uh, node and also upgrade your image to whatever I want you to do. So when I first saw this, I thought, mm -hmm, I like pictures. I like moving pictures. So I drew a, a moving picture, something like you know, a five-year-old should understand. So I created my provisional nodes there. So I've got my little server line. And then I created my control pane, which is your masters. And then something called ETCD. Some people pronounce it etcd, but also some people pronounce Linux Linux. So it's, it's, it's ETCD. And it's a distributed file system, allowing you to actually make changes across the cluster. So we've got our master nodes, and those are the same ones that we actually press there for our API server schedule and controller manager, and then etcd to manage the file distribution. Each one of those workers is our physical provisioned um, node, not a pod, and they run a Docker and a Kubernetes service on them. So here comes Rory. Rory says, please give me uh, the A Docker image. Pretty simple. Rory says two A's, please, which will go through the demo, uh, asking for A's. And the master server will say, find me the first two servers that match the spec that I want to send there and run those A's. Rory doesn't know or care for which server is running that. All I know is that I've asked for something and you've delivered. This is very pertinent when you actually think about cloud infrastructure because when you ask for something, it might be a spot server that you auction. Anyone here auction spot servers before? Most of your data right now is being processed off spot servers. And they just auction, they say, give me the lowest price or the highest price that I'll bid for them. Provision a node, get it, run the process, and then actually just take the data off and then the provision node just dies. But we have to talk about the meeting of data. Because my demo actually shows how to actually do pods, deployments, and services. It's actually a restaurant that I have to image it out. <laughs> Apparently, if you take something of an image as yours, so that's my. <laughs> Talk to me later about copyright. But... <laughs> so, let's look at what we're going to do. We're going to look at pods, and your pod basically runs a Docker image. We're going to create in our pod an image called Simple Service. Now, I just tweeted this now before, and the author who actually created that uh, actually replied to me saying, I'm um, very excited to using my image, and I said, yes, I have to type your name out a thousand times. I remember it, though. I want to say, Oscar, also, please just change your name. <laughs> M. Hausenblas. You can go check that out. It's a whole conversation. Not an easy name to remember. And this is a pod. Remember, no physical server. A pod is something I want to run a spec on, and then a pod can run an image. This spec says, the desired state for a pod. Please run this for me, and I'm asking you to actually run a Docker image on it. It's a desired state. 
And I'm also asking you please to open that port into the cluster. When I first started on Kubernetes, I thought, oh, open port, I can get it on my PC. I, I haven't, and I won't need to connect to the internet once during this presentation. So I'm running my entire cluster locally on my laptop. Now when I open up a port, it's opening up a port to the underlying cluster. We're going to create some deployments. So what is a deployment? A deployment is a specific spec for a pod, and usually it's version. So we're going to deploy two versions, version 1 and version 2 to our pods. So here's a deployment. You can see there that I've got my actual version in there, and I've also got there saying when you do that deployment, please create two replicas, two of those instances. So if you've ever run Docker, you don't do Docker PS, you'll get two actual uh, instance Docker instances running. We have labels similar to Docker also, so you can actually not forget that. Anyone actually forget the Docker instance and you just have to oh, okay, delete the whole thing? No, I think I've done that about three times this week. And then we're going to use that image there, the uh, M Housing Blast simple service, and also open up the port. So to reiterate, a pod is a spec that is run with your intention of state. A deployment is actually the version or, um, of that actual spec. Last is service. A service, anyone here done any Nginx reverse proxy? So if you can relate to it, a service is basically an entry point into your deployment. And a service is a load balancer or an ingress controller or anything that is a line of sight access to your underlying cluster. So in this example there, we're going to create a service, a load balancer, and access that simple service and see how it runs. So we've got our service here, and we define it as a load balancer on port 80. We've defined the spec, the selector, of what the original pod spec is that we're going to use. Aren't you glad I did that diagram before explaining everything twice? Stop. Demo time. He would keep my hero. <laughs> That's what with vanilla ice and him at the same time. Oh, I feel old. Okay. So what are we going to demo? Uh, let me open my favorite editor, Visual Studio Code. So we're going to demo the simple service here. So we've got a Docker file, and that Docker file there is just running a Python script. And that Python script, I'm running at a very low resolution here, has an info endpoint. This is, this is pretty nifty. An info endpoint, and it will just tell you the version. So we're going to run a Docker image. It's going to give you the version via REST endpoint. And we can modify that to show how we do deployments. Because we're going to say, do a deployment, and then change the version so we know that we can actually see we've rolled out a deployment. OK, so I'm now going to create a Docker image of that simple service. So we're going to take you through the entire step we're going to do it in Docker, we're going to do it in Kubernetes, and then I'm going to treat you because I'm actually going to do it with a high-level Docker Compose file. So I'm in my folder. All of these examples will be given to you afterwards. And I'm going to go Docker image. If I make a mistake, please point this out and laugh terribly. Grep slash I and simple. So this is the Docker image. I've already previously downloaded it. Starting that Ooh. images. Thankfully, Mike, my trusted assistant, is here. And now we have a small little Docker container, 700 megs, the size of a CD, <laughs> to run one small little Python script. <laughs> it's Python. Well, okay. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna attack Python. There, those people are dangerous. <laughs> so let's let's run this, and we've got a nice command. So Docker run. Slash p, and we're going to bind it to a port 9876, 9876, so it's internal and external to Docker. This is a, who here has seen Docker first? I'm seeing some faces here that are like, whoa, what's this, what's this little man doing now? Okay, so this is a two talking one. And then we're going to actually say, 
safety, environmental variable. Can you guys see this? Complain, please. Richard Hannesburg has been complained a lot. And then I'm going to set the variable there to simple service. I'm talking and typing at the same time. Version. Version. Equals to 0 0.9.0. Remember the version that we had on our Python script was 0 0.5.0. So I'm going to override the environment variable so you can actually see, wait a second, I have actually done that deployment. And then I'm going to actually type out this guy's name, M. Hart. Sounds like a tractor. Uh, Rory, I just saw it like one of your tweets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I must. Asking for shorting. the house and bus service and everything like that. Cool. That's what you need to do to run Docker. Anyone who's told you anything differently is lying. So now my Docker instance is running. It's telling me it's bound to the port 9876, and I can actually go and hit that port there. Blah blah blah. Local host. 9876, and I'm going to hit the info service that we showed before, and it should give me back, ah, yeah, version. We've overridden the version there, so we know that it would actually be the version that we set. So this is a Docker uh, service running a Python script. We started it up. Now we want to shut it down. Now you're going to see the, the hell that is Docker. So I'm going to close that there. Is that still running? Yeah. Docker PS. PC, no, Docker is not PC, Docker PS, and it's running there. Now I have to go manually kill it. So violently Docker kill, you can just go 981 and it'll kill it. And I can go Docker PS and it's gone. I have to do that manually, which is what we want to see. We want to see what Kubernetes brings to the table and how we can do this in deployment and also have those nice production grade services added in at the same time. So the first thing that we're going to actually do is we're going to go back to our spec. And this is the spec that we saw previously, the deployment. So we've got that M Housen Blast simple service. We're going to bind to port 9876. And then we've got a version there that we've got to set that we had to do by hand when we passed in environment variables. The only difference here is that I only create two replicas. That might be 200. I'm not going to return to the Demo that would be crazy talk. But I'm going to put two replicas there. We're going to see how it rolls out and then change the version. Okay. So I am now going to use the uh, Kubernetes command line, which is also installed as part of the little tick box up there. And that is called kubectl. So kubectl, you can have uh, uh, both read and write operations. And we're going to go through kubectl create slash f, and we're going to do deep 09 and that's the script that we did there. And it's going to go create and say, hey, you've got nodes. Put, find those, provision those nodes, pop it on there, and also start them up. I can see what's running by saying get deploy. And kubectl is saying, you want to, I'm giving you two, Two is up to date with the version you want. Everything's hunky dory. We can also get the individual parts that this is running on. So we want the replica set. Cube CTL. Oops. Chat better then. Cube CTL get RS. So now we're going to get the replica sets. And the replica sets, remember those replicas, just maintain and track all of the servers that the deployment has started. So now we have a 5 by 5 replica set there. We can go cube, ctl, get pods. Remember, a pod is the image that you're running. A node can run multiple pods. And now I've got two. So I'm going to go cube, ctl, create a service. So I'm going to go expose, deploy, deployment, and that simple service deployment. And we're going to tell it to make the type, the R2 types equals to, for some reason, capital case at load balancer, because you know everyone does capitals, balancer, Q 
CTL explodes deployment, the simple service deploy, and the path is load balancer. Service is exposed. And now I have a load balancer there that I can access outside the cluster. Very important concept. And it'll give me the port there and also the RP. So I can hit that. Let's just do it again. HTTP local host port 9876. And I can just do, just to make sure that it's not caching it, health, which should actually say, oh, you're missing it out. Oh, cool. I like to live my day. <laughs> Healthy, true. And then I can also hit the info there. And it's version 0.9, I've like changed it. So this is from the spec of the deployment that we wanted to actually uh, publish. So let's get fancy now. Because that's one thing, deploy, and you could do that with Docker. But what about rolling out a deployment and gradually and gracefully actually degradating your nodes? But imagine going to production, you've got your Docker instances, you want to say the, the clients currently on that, don't just switch it off, just actually roll them off. And there's multiple different architectural patterns that you can do to allow that. So we're going to just do a basic deployment, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to actually now introduce you to the version 1 of the application. The only change really is that it is a, an environment available with version 1.0. So it can give us confirmation that we have actually done the deployment. So we're going to do a very similar exercise. We're going to go kubectl, apply, slash fd10. YAML. We've got our load balancer uh, running, which we shouldn't modify the load balancer. It has nothing to really to do with the underlying pods. And it is configured. So how do we know it's actually configured? Well, one step is that we can actually just hit that version. We refresh. And eventually, when it actually does the deployment, it will come around. And this is running on a laptop, and it's Windows, and... You know, a lot of the other developers have better PCs than me recently. That scheduler service, remember it has to schedule and everything that's will come around. Okay, let's see if it's actually taking some time. And we can do that by actually going kubectl get pods. And it's running, so this should actually work there. We did set it to D10. Yay! Or his ego is saved. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is running on the app. Now the scheduler service goes and says things go run, and it slowly degradates those other nodes in a graceful way. It, it ensures that all of the people hitting you, that load balance will be load balance off to the, uh, the new nodes, the new version, and we'll slowly be doing that. So obviously if, you've got a, if you want to actually create a more performant server, you can actually do this quicker. Please speak to my management about getting me a new laptop. <laughs> okay, so we can actually also roll that back. So if you want to see the, the versions, so kubectl, roll out, history, and we want to say deploy and the simple service slash deploy. So we want to see exactly what we did and the history of that rollout. Now we're looking for two revisions. Revision 1 was the original 0 0.9 and revision 2 is the uh, version 1. Oh no, our deployment didn't go right. What are we going to do? We'll never see our children again. Let's roll back. Let's roll back to the original one and without actually changing it because it keeps a state of all of those deployments. I have very little hard disk space in, anymore because of uh, Kubernetes. There's a, there's a lot of space. So we're going to go kubectl and undo deploy uh, rollout. Uh, so kubectl rollout undo deploy and we can tell it, please, uh, undo deploy, simple service, dash deploy. And we're going to say, please use a revision to revision 
equals to 1. Now we've got two revisions there. We're going to roll back to the uh, version 1. And it's going to attempt to do that. So we can actually see what it's doing. We can go get parts. And now it's running and it's terminating those old two parts that it had created. And slowly but surely, this is why it's going to, it took it a little while. We can go get parts. Still terminating. It's shutting down those docking instances and bringing up the new ones and then load balancing to the new session. Come on, that's hot. I can dance for you guys. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so um, how about those spring blocks? <laughs> so get parts. Yay! So now it should actually be version 0 0.9. Yay! So imagine doing this now with your systems. Remember, anything can run Docker. It's a versioning control system and more. So let's, let's look at how to do this now with one easy step using Docker Compose. So the first thing I want to do is remove that. The law of cloud is don't leave the cloud running. Okay, <laughs> you're going to spend a lot of money. Um, and we're going to go kubectl delete service, simple service slash deploy. And then we're also going to delete the deployment and then so we've deleted our service first this is load balancing and then our deployment and we can actually see that there's nothing there nothing with the hands get parts oh, it's terminated because you know this is a live demo and you have to go slow laptop and it's terminating slowly but surely so what we're going to do while this is terminating I'm going to show you the docker compose file Anyone here use Docker Compose? Anyone here at my talk, that, at that awesome talk I did at the Docker user group, where we discussed functional reactive endpoints and Docker Compose and stuff? Okay, so my what is my handle? You guys are going to follow me? You're going to just stalk me? I'm, I'm fine with that. I'll, I'm fine. If it means that you stalk me, I'm fine with that. So this is Docker Compose. Docker Compose is a way, it's a tool to allow you to compose your Docker clusters, not clusters, but your orchestration in a, a very central way. But it's not doing what Kubernetes does. So recently there was a war, the container wars. Anyone know that we were at war? There was a container war. And the war was between Kubernetes and Docker. And eventually they just gave up because, you know, that's what happens when Oracle sues Google and stuff like that. They just gave up and they actually said we're going to bake it in together. And one of the outcomes of the war, the armistice, was that Docker Compose now will work seamlessly with Kubernetes. So let's see how we're going to do that. We have three images here. We've got a database running Postgres. We have a Words API server that is going to run five uh, replicas. And that's going to give us a Docker Word so we can actually build a nice website and do a word generator. And then we've got a web a basic uh, Apache web server that's going to serve that up on port 88. You don't even have to do the port bind. Uh, Kubernetes and Docker is going to do that for us. Let's make sure this thing has come back. Get pods and terminate it. So let's actually go into the other folder. And we're going to run a, a little command to say, please make Kubernetes the default orchestration tool for Docker. Pretty important. Docker is still kind of trying to sell people Swarm, right? Remember, like, you know, Microsoft trying to sell you ID? Yeah, no. Hey, uh, it's not going to work. Hey, we don't want that. So we're going to go export uh, Docker underscore orchestrator. Orchestrator? Yes. Equals to Kubernetes. It's a hard word to spell. Even misspelled the, the folder you're creating the demo. <laughs> <laughs> it's a hard word to spell. Kubernetes. So now default head op uh, option. So then we can go Docker stack deploy. And we're going to say, we're going to give it a name, Wordsmith. 
Um, and we're going to say, please use the Docker Compose file that we showed you now. This is going to do everything we did in the demo of the deployment of the services, of the parts, of the nodes, of the ports, and everything using Docker Compose. So it says the stack has been created. It's going to bring up your replica sets, your DB, your words, your web. And then we can go Docker PS. Got a lot of little Docker images there. Let's make that smaller, actually. A lot of images. That was quick, eh? Okay? And then we can also go who CTL get pods. And we've got those pods running pretty pretty quick. Okay? So what does that give us? And we can also go kubectl get services. kubectl get services. And we're looking for that load balancer service, which we will get automatically from Docker Compose because we actually specified it in the Compose file. And there's our load balancer there telling us that port 8080 is available. And we can go to localhost port 8080. And we've got our webs our word server there, and that's generating from one of the actual five replica sets a word there, and you can see there the IP address, a little bit small there, of each of the nodes that it's running with. And this was released when they're, this is part of the DockerCon uh, release when they were originally announced Kubernetes for Docker and the Container Wars was over. Honestly, yeah. So let's, let's actually now stop that, so Docker stack RN Wordsmith. Wordsmith. And it'll actually shut down everything, get rid of the load balances, and actually stop the pods. And we can actually go say, get pods, and we'll say terminate, 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 terminate. Demo done. Mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> Don't have a mic drop. Getting fancy. That wasn't fancy. That was like, you know, Meat and potatoes, which I'm in the image of being one speaking about that, <laughs> that image. So volumes. So we encounter a lot of developers battling with the cloud and docking and everything, primarily because they just don't know how to write files to a central storage. So Kubernetes actually allows you to do that. And in this example here, we're writing a Nginx server to an AWS web store. So it has built in um, kind of a knowledge of the majority of the standard file systems that you want to write to. What about auto-scaling? Recently at a consultancy engagement that I went to, um, their Kubernetes cluster fell over because of Meltdown. Because Meltdown took another 20% of the CPU. So I said, okay, cool, what is your auto-scaling to set up? And I go, what? Why would you use Kubernetes if you don't auto-scale? When this service there is actually going to hit more than 50% CPU, it's going to scale until that CPU usage is actually less than 50% to a maximum of 10 replicas. Obama would be proud. We wouldn't have actually broken the, twi uh, the Twitter sphere or the internet because it would have actually auto-scaled up. Now you can also tie this in to buy little spot instances via auction and you can actually not even have to own those servers or those nodes. Advanced Kubernetes, there's so many features. We have sidecar containers. If you want to actually run a container, multiple Docker images inside a container. We have in the containers, it will build your Git and the Docker images and put it into your pods. We have tanks and tolerations. I had to Google today, thanks to Mike, to actually work out what the word means. But it basically means that I like that container for that image. Think GPU, Bitcoin mining. You want to actually have a miner on only GPU instances, high CPU, or very healthy pods. Down on the API, so Kubernetes can call on itself to say, am I actually healthy? And then prod presets, so you can set the secrets and passwords for your pods for your team without having to actually give them that. And the last one is Kubernetes of Kubernetes, federated clusters across multiple topologies that you'll find in certain cloud infrastructure. So what I'm trying to tell you is that it's that simple to actually start with Kubernetes. You download the Edge channel for Docker, it has it baked in as such though, and you start actually using Docker in a production grade setting. We've seen a huge propagation across uh, Kubernetes, across the cloud uh, providers, Amazon, Azure, well Google can, Google has Kubernetes. 
Thank you, Google. If you're listening, thank you. Um, and it has been chosen as the container orchestration of Tuesday. So the container walls are over, and if you want to come chat to me afterwards, you can ask me some questions. Here's the examples, and then um, M. Hausen Plus's examples are on the in Cuba, Kubernetes example project he works for Red Hat. Thank you, Red Hat. And then that's all the examples. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, um, I've done like zero reading on this, but uh, when it comes to uh, rolling out a new deployment and it terminates your old pods, um, how, is there any way to make it complete a job that is possibly possibly running on the old pod before it terminates? Because I you find do, that yes, you do get events. Okay, so you can actually trigger off certain events, like a shutdown event. Um, it also depends on the actual underlying cloud server. So yeah. for example, the event might be that someone has auctioned off your pod. Because if you get if you get into a pod auction and they bid higher than you, you're going to actually lose that pod, it's going to shut it down, and then it's going to move it off. So that is a specific event that you'll get specific to that provider. What you, you're saying is that just a generic event, you do get those events though. Okay. Yeah, you want to know if someone has actually paid more than you, because they'll just take it under underneath you. Yeah, fair enough. And then that, remember the Twitter one? And then Twitter one. Okay, all well, good? Okay. Thanks, everyone. Cool. Thanks.